Yesterday, my colleague Matthias gave a, a great talk about the, the trends in banking as a service with bundling, unbundling, and the rebundling of services. Today, I'd like to make it a little bit more real. I want to talk to you about a conceptual solution framework for unbundling and rebundling services. This is Be the Orchestrator for your Banking as a Service, and I'm Ian Ward, API Integration and Microservices Lead for Software AG Australia and New Zealand. What Matthias talked about yesterday was the evolution of the banking and financial services and the trends of bundling services together and the later trend of unbundling those services in order to support new, uh, new channels to market through mobile and, and web. And then the emerging, uh, the emerging trend of rebundling those services allowing organizations to build new banking offers using the services of existing banking services as well as bundling with other services a lot of drivers he talked about the the high customer acquisition cost and increasing competition and the customer's desire for a service which is truly specialized for them so how do we enable that is it just more open APIs? Rebundling really matters in differentiation. When we're trying to create innovative products, when we're trying to create applications that scale, when we're trying to make it easy for customers and partners to interact with you, and when we're trying to make them easy to adopt, that can run anywhere. All about creating a customer experience, the simplification of end-to-end -end best of breed services. So all of these things, the requirement for speed for change, moving to the cloud, frictionless business, defeating disrup disruption, distributing everything, mean that we need to look at the architecture in a different way. Core banking systems were traditionally monoliths. And in order to unbundle those services, we need to be looking at a microservices architecture, taking the services that were all together in one application and stripping them out and turning them into smaller applications, each one offering a service. That gives us a lot more agility and flexibility, being able to work with individual services. But of course, as we do this, we're losing the lower operational cost and complexity that we had with a monolith. Things get more complex. You have to manage more things. If we look at uh, the conceptual solution framework that, that we're talking about, we're looking at the traditional core banking platform at the bottom. And in order to enable us to migrate towards a, a distributed microservices architecture, we need to put some pieces in place. And those pieces are APIs. We create a central uh, governing piece that acts as glue between all of the different stakeholders, the channels, the partners, and the internal corporate services that need to use the core banking system. And we create APIs managed to allow that interaction to be decoupled from the core banking system. That allows us then to start to migrate to a microservices architecture. And when we change the back end, when we change that core banking system, we don't need to change the channels and the internal systems and the partners. And this can happen over a period of time. If you think about your monolithic core banking system at the bottom, we can create a facade or a services layer which extrapolates the different services that are being offered by the core banking system and offers them as APIs. And then we can have a mediation system that allows the channels and the internal users of the APIs and the external partners to access those services through the service mediation layer. And we have runtime control over 
who gets access to what, obviously. That service mediation can then give us access to the monolithic services without it knowing that the, uh, the services are being offered in that way. As we migrate, as we move forward, we can then begin to create microservices that offer the same services as the monolithic services. As we migrate service by service, we can then use the service mediation layer to switch over or swing channels from the existing monolithic services to the new microservices. These microservices can be built on premises and they can supersede the, the business logic provided by the monolith. As we move forward, we'll get more and more of these microservices and less and less functionality will be left in the monolith. We call this the strangler pattern or strangling the monolith. As we move forward, we can then begin to migrate some of those services into the cloud, giving us the ability to scale. Because the applications we've created are already microservices and they're effectively cloud native services, it will be very easy to migrate them into an equivalent cloud service, into AKS or EKS or GKS. We can then use a cloud-based API gateway and the services can access those new microservices in the cloud without knowing that they're there. It doesn't really matter to the channel whether the service is still in the monolith, is in a, an on-premise hosted microservice, or is in fact being hosted in the cloud. As we get more and more of these new services, as we get more and more of the channels and new third-party apps, they can choose to use the cloud-based services directly if all of the services that they need are there. Or they can be channeled through the, the, the service mediation layer. Really doesn't matter. So that's the way we would migrate, the way we would evolve our services to move to a microservice environment in the cloud. We've seen we go from the monolith to the microservices. But as we get more and more of these microservices, then we can begin to have a problem. As we said earlier, we get more agility and flexibility, but at the cost of additional complexity and uh, maintenance and, and management costs. We begin to have to answer some quite tricky questions. How are these services going to work with each other? How are they going to find each other? got lots of these services, some of them running in the cloud, some of them running on premises, some, some all over the place. How do you know these services are going to securely connect to each other? How can you control which service uses which other service? In a monolith, it's typically OK for any service to access any other service because they're all managed and written by the same people in the same place. But once you move to a microservices environment, then it becomes less clear who owns which data or who is allowed access to which data and who who are these calls coming from? They're coming network calls. Where do the calls come from and in what context? How are they going to detect failures and do a retry? How does it log, monitor, trace service calls? Are we going to uh, code all of this into each microservice? I would say not. As, uh, as these problems became apparent, a technology called Service Mesh came into being. And if we look at the comparison here, if you don't have a Service Mesh, if you're just writing your microservices and coding everything, then for each service that you write, you have to write the code to establish a secure connection, discover and call the service, detect issues, recover, log for forensics, trace for observability, each one of the services written by different teams will have to implement all of these features and capabilities. That seems like a waste. With a service mesh, the service mesh 
implement some of these things for you transparently. So the service writer just writes the code to call the service. And underneath, the service mesh will apply policies. It will apply a policy to establish this secure connection. It has policies to discover where a service is. It also has policies to detect issues and recover, log for forensics and trace for observability. And all of these things come out of the box with a service mesh. So that solves the problems, right? We've now got the monolith into microservices running in a service mesh. So that, is that all that we need? Well, not necessarily. Those issues are all very low level network issues, if you like. But how can I reroute services based on consumer context? Based on who's calling or in what context they're calling, maybe we want to call a service in one place or another. How can I control access and mask sensitive data based on who's calling the service? How can I see who's using my application and what they're doing? If all we've got is information about the microservices, we don't necessarily know which APIs are being called, which, which application logic is being used and by whom. How can I personalize the app behavior for my consumers? And how can I reuse these services and govern them at an application level? Again, are we going to code it in the service? Some of the things that we've looked at are very technical network type things, the discovery, observability, fault tolerance, connectivity. All of those are things that service mesh will give you and definitely worth having. They are a great benefit to the application. But on top of that, there's the writing the code to mask sensitive data, depending on who's calling, writing the code to understand who your consumer is, writing the code to root based on data and writing the code to obtain business analytics. And again, we're talking about doing this for every service. And it gets on uh, more complicated if you think about different domains, potentially running in different runtime platforms in different clouds or different data centers, each with their own service mesh. Are we going to then talk between those service meshes in the same way as we were talking about talking between services? As you get more and more services, then we're going to have more and more connectivity, more and more issues, and we're going to end up with a Death Star. And we all know what happened to that. I think it's better to find a better solution. We need something that can add context awareness to the service mesh. And that's where we've come up with a solution, an application service mesh or an app mesh allows you to write the code for your service and then have it configured by the app mesh. The app mesh allows you to Appify, if you like, or add application context to the communication between your microservices, allows you to do service consumption enablement and app and API level monitoring so that you understand who's calling which API or application within your different microservices, and allows you to do context aware policies like routing and data masking, and allows you to do uh, app and API integration enablement, as well as being able to mesh landscapes across different areas, different uh, runtime areas. So the app mesh adds application context and allows you to manage the apps, not just the services. It gives you the application context intelligent context to allow you to do routing and throttle traffic, tra traffic throttling, allows you to do user authentication and private data protection, mesh visibility, monitoring, and usage tracking at the application level, and context-aware data transformation for personalization of services for different applications, allowing for better reuse. 
and then it gives you the consumption, reuse, and governance that you definitely want in this sort of scenario. So if we add that application context to a service mesh, we have what we call app mesh. And app mesh sits on top of your standard uh, microservice environment, no matter where it runs. It can sit on top of Istio. It can sit on top of uh, other service meshes. So we've got a microservices environment that's uh, scalable. It, it's able to run the different services we need. But now we come across another problem, the problem of creating composite services. Each of our atomic microservices does a small thing, and it does it well, and it's scalable. But in a real application, we need to pull those services together, and we need to compose composite microservices and expose those to the applications. How do we do that? It's not as simple as just calling the microservices in code. We could do that, but it's it's not that simple. We need to think about how we're going to do the orchestration, how we're going to do transactionality and rollbacks and error handling. So we need a, a platform that allows us to easily assemble and orchestrate those microservices into higher grain services. And that's where a, an integration platform can be handy. If we're looking at a lot of these different services and composing them into higher level composite microservices and then pulling them together into applications, we end up with quite complex interactions. And one way to handle this is through an event-driven process. So having each of these services trigger events, which then trigger the next stage and create a workflow of execution of these different services. To do that, Software AG offers a, an orchestration engine an integration platform as a service that allows very easy composition of applications through the drag and drop of the execution of these services and offers complex mapping, error correction, transactions, all of the things you would like, as well as offering a multi-persona interface, allowing mission critical integrations to be done by a, an integration specialist and business level, simple, less critical integrations to be done by less technical users, all within the same platform. Comes out of the box with 300, 400 plus connectors, recipes for creating new integration applications, and is a true on-premise multi-cloud SaaS hybrid platform, allowing you to create those microservices where you want them, how you want them, and exposing them to a web-based, easy-to-use orchestration platform in the cloud. So when we're thinking about becoming that orchestrator, becoming that, that, uh, that platform as a service, banking as a service, we really need quite a lot of different technologies. And Software AG has pulled all of these different technologies together into a platform to allow you to create what you need to be able to create, a personalized application that's easy to assemble, that distributes into any different uh, environment and is able to constantly evolve. That bundling, rebundling, unbundling, rebundling, as was said yesterday by Matthias, is a cyclic process. So we need to be able to go on that journey together. So we've seen through this that there's a convergence of the different technologies that are required to build these, these uh, applications. There's API management critical to any microservice environment. There's application service mesh, being able to add the context to the integration between those microservices, the integration technology to be able to pull them all together. 
and it acts as the glue, if you like, between the services that we offer and the applications in a in a modern application world with personalized assembled distributed evolving applications so that was the the theory i hope uh, hope it was interesting please do put questions in the in the chat in the question and answer and we'll get to those in a little while but what i'd like to do now is take some time to to show you live how this app mesh technology works and how we can use the app mesh technology and the api gateway to look at a running kubernetes microservice environment and see what app what services are running to amplify a service to apply application policies to it and then see those changes take uh, take effect. So let me quickly skip over to my browser. And also I'll open up Lens. I don't know if you know Lens. Lens is a, a, a graphical user interface uh, to administer and manage uh, Kubernetes clusters. So I've got this one pointed to my Kubernetes cluster, and you can see here the workloads, the pods that are running in the development namespace. I'm going to run up a an application. It's a, it's not a banking application, unfortunately. It's it's actually a, a logistics application, and shows the the uh, running of some trucks and and how they uh, how we can track those trucks as they run around the country. Let me just quickly run up that application. It creates a number of microservices. And you can see those starting up now. Uh, there's a, a, an incoming uh, web application. There's a an internal API gateway that that directs traffic within the microservices application there's a a position tracker that that's constantly tracking where the the trucks are uh, there's a telemetry service and there's a staff service that tracks the drivers and shows uh, or controls how fast they're going at any one time and uh, so that you can you can track how they're they're going if I open up my browser now, we should be able to connect to that. And there we go. This is the the application. And you can see it's tracking five trucks. And if I click on a truck, it takes me to that truck on the map. And at the bottom, you'll see it shows me some information about the driver of the truck. So it's it's got a photo and his name. And if I go to Kiali, Kiali will show us uh, the uh, the service mesh information, the the monitoring information that Istio is giving us about this microservice application. And you can see, as I said, there are a number of of different microservices. There's a web app. There's a, an internal API gateway. There's a position tracker, the fleet service, the vehicle te telemetry. It will tell us things things about the the network, about how how good the traffic is between these services. But it really doesn't tell us anything about the application, who the consumer is, or or uh, which type of of API is being called in each one of these interactions. So this is really good information for, for monitoring the state of the application and to make sure it's working okay. But for an application owner, it doesn't tell me very much at all. And this is where App Mesh will come in. If I go to uh, my API gateway, this is the Software AG API gateway, and it's running in the same uh, cluster. And if I type the username correctly, 
I'll be able to log in. And we'll see the API gateway is a, a fully featured API gateway uh, for API management, allows us to, to see the APIs that we have available and to apply policies to those APIs and to, to see metrics and, and analytics information about the APIs that we're running. But it also gives us access to AppMesh. And AppMesh is introspecting the Kubernetes cluster to find out what services are available. And it's found itself, interestingly enough, but it's also found all of these services that we've just run up. And one of those is the staff service. And I'm going to jump into the staff service and see what it tells us. It tells us that it's in the uh, development namespace and it's an HTTP uh, service, REST service. And it's showing me the deployment configuration from, from uh, Kubernetes. And it's also showing me that there's an Istio sidecar attached to it. And that's how we're getting all of the service mesh uh, details. But it really tells us nothing, as I said before, about the type of traffic, the application that's sitting on top of it. So what I'm going to do is hit this Appify button. And what that does is creates me an API entry in the API gateway to represent the traffic that flows in and out of this, this service. And if I go down here and click on it, it takes me to the metadata for this API. Of course, just by clicking that button, it doesn't know any more than, than Istio knew in that we don't know what the services are or the APIs. But if I own this microservice, I can go to the developer and I can ask him, this microservice, what's the API that, that, it, uh, that it has? And if he gives me a Swagger file, I can import that Swagger file. And with that, the API gateway now knows what the interface is. It knows that there's a, a GET request for the vehicle and that that GET request will give me some information about uh, about the vehicle and it tells me there's a a post which takes the vehicle speed and so this is where it's tracking how fast each driver goes so that we can know that they're not being um, not not breaking any rules okay so now we know that we've got a a staff service we know that it's got an api we can now apply some policies to it. So if I go to the policy screen, you can see that our API gateway has a very graphical visual way of representing the policies that we apply to the traffic. It shows the, the blue line of traffic coming from a client. We do threat protection. We do transport policies. We can identify uh, and access uh, control. We can do processing of the, of the request. Then we can do traffic monitoring and routing in this case we've got straight through routing it goes straight through to the the uh, uh, microservice so let's add some policies first of all let's add a monitoring policy so if i hit the uh, monitoring policies and i edit the api then i can log the invocation so every time somebody calls an API on this microservice, I can log the fact that it's being called. And I can even store the request headers and the response headers and payload so that we know what was happening with that, um, with that call. If I hit save and I go back to the app mesh and go back to the staff service, I can see that I now have an API. All I've done though is document that in my local API gateway. But what I can do now is hit the deploy button and AppMesh will automatically inject a, an API gateway, a micro gateway into the pod. 
And that micro gateway will apply the policies that I've just specified. So if I now go back to um, to Lens, you'll see that it's it's just run up a new staff service. It's now got four containers instead of three because it's got my new uh, API gateway. And if we go back to the web application now, you can see it's still working. And if I click on these drivers, it must be calling the API, right? So if I go back to App Mesh to the staff service, we can now go to the analytics screen and look at the calls in the last 15 minutes. And we should see that it's now logging all of the calls that are being executed between the different microservices or into this staff service. And there you go. We can now see that there have been a number of calls. You'll see quite a few, few calls because there's a simulator in there simulating the movement of the trucks. And so we get the, the speed of the truck being logged every second or, or something. So you can see all of these different calls. And the great thing is we can now see which calls are which. So we can see the, the post calls with the speed and the get calls, which are the ones when I clicked on a driver to find his information. If I click on one of those, it can now filter and show me just the transactions that are get transactions. And it can show me all of the information that we've got about the response times and the gateway versus provider times. And even if we click into one of these, we can see that it, it gives us the headers, it gives us the, the payload, it gives us all of the information about that call because we're logging the tran transaction. Let's try and get a little bit cleverer though. That's, logging is one thing, but let's do something more interesting. If if we now go back to the policies, let's see if we can do something clever. Imagine the name of the driver. We might not want anybody accessing the web page to see the name of the driver. We might only want people who are authorized to see the name of the driver. We can let them see the photo because they'll they'll see them anyway through the through the window of the, the truck, but then we might not want them to know the, the name. So how can we do that? We have the option to do response processing. And one of the options in res response processing is data masking. But first we need to identify the consumer. So let's go to identity and access. In the identity and access, we have a number of different ways of uh, identifying and authorizing the user. So we go to identify and authorize and we edit. We can add an identity, identify and authorize. And we've got, as you can see, a whole load of ways of identifying who's calling this microservice from an API key through uh, JWT tokens or Kerberos or OAuth or anything you can imagine, really. So in my case, I'm going to use an API key. And to to use that API key, I need a registered application. I've created an application earlier, and that application, if I go to the Applications tab, is called Node Tours. It's the tours. That application essentially associates an API key with a consumer. So if we go back to my policy, I can say that I'm going to allow the application any registered application, so node tours, to pass its API key. And if it does, I'll know that that's the application that's that's using this, uh, this web app. And if I go back to, uh, no, if I also want not just registered applications, but anonymous access i can also click the allow anonymous so now when the call comes in it will check if there's an api key if the api key is associated with a registered application i'll know that that's an a an authorized caller otherwise it will be anonymous now we want to process the response we want to do some data masking 
So in the data masking, if it's anonymous, then we want to mask. And there's a number of ways we can do masking using XPath if it's XML or, or JSON path if it's, if it's JSON or using regular expressions. I'm gonna use a JSON path and I'm gonna say that if it's a name, then I'm gonna mask it with, with stars. So if there's a name field in the response, because we're in the response processing, then mask it out with stars. That's good. Uh, and now we need another policy, another masking policy that says, if we know who the consumer is, if the consumer is in the node tools application, then don't mask. So we just don't put any masking here. And it will apply both policies and it will say, well, if I know who the, uh, the application is, so they've passed me an API key, then I don't mask. And if they don't give me a, an API key, then we mask. Okay, good. So if I save that, our API definition in the main API gateway has been updated, but our app mesh is still running the old version. So if I go back to my app mesh, I can see here it's running my deployed service, but it's running the old policies. What I can do is deploy again. And if we go back to, to here, we'll see that it's running up the new version with the new policies. And when it's ready, Kubernetes will, will get rid of the old version. So we've just got the new version. And if we go back to the web app now, we'll see that first of all, it's still working. And if I click on one of these drivers, it now masks out the name. So because I'm an unauthorized user, it's still showing me the same information, but it's not showing me the name. Now this is pretty cool because we've done all of this without actually changing any of those microservices. We didn't touch the code, but we've been able to personalize the application based on policies that we've applied uh, after the fact. Now, you're gonna say, but how do we know it's really working? Uh, if you put in an API key, will it show the name? I've got a little plugin to, um, to Chrome here called mod header, and it allows me to pass custom request headers to, uh, to requests. And that's my API key. So if I hit that button, it should now, when I click, it will pass that API key. I'll be authorized. And sure enough, it's now showing me the data because I'm an authorized user. Pretty cool, huh? If we go back to the API gateway and we see the, the um, staff service API analytics, you'll also be able to see those additional calls and you can see all of the calls that have been through and all the different analytics. And if we go down, we'll be able to filter by get requests again. And you'll see that it now knows that when I pass the API keys, the application that's calling is Node Tours, where before it was anonymous default application. And that's how it knows that it's able to mask, uh, not mask the data. The API gateway here, uh, the policies, we have huge number of different policies, including the request processing and routing. Routing is another area where based on the context of the incoming call, you might want to route to one service or another. And uh, you can do that based on the context or the content of the traffic passing through. And we've also got um, a number of other um, response processing um, policies. And you can even write your own policies. Uh, if you don't have a policy here, you can invoke a and a web methods integration server service to apply a custom policy. Uh, so you could do whatever 
you want to and you can do that on the request or on the response okay so that was my my demo for today i hope that was uh interesting and if i skip back now to the presentation i'll just finish off with a a couple of slides on where you can find more information more resources We've got a lot of online resources so that you can play with this stuff yourself. There's uh, Docker images on uh, the Docker store. If you go to hub.docker.com and search for software AG, you'll see a lot of different uh, images that, that we put up there for you to, uh, to trial our software. Uh, there's the API gateway, there's the API micro, micro gateway. There's also the microservice runtime, which is our integration platform. Uh, that will allow you to to create microservices that implement integration logic. So connect to third party systems, uh, generate APIs or consume APIs or do complex map mapping of information. So creating mapping services and universal messaging, which is our uh, uh, our universal event messaging bus that you can use again within a Kubernetes environment to create event driven applications. I talked at the end of the, the presentation about orchestrating services to create higher, grain, uh, higher granularity services. Uh, you can download the trial, uh, or sorry, you can sign up for a, an iPass trial uh, integration platform as a service with the API gateway, API portal, or integration platform, or, or all of the above uh, to allow you to to do that sort of um, integration and play with that. Just go to webmethods.io and hit the uh, free trial button. And there's also a software download. If you're more traditional, you want to download it to your local machine. If you go to our tech community, softwareag.com, there's a downloads section where you can download a full, full copy of our integration platform, a there's also a service designer, a, a lightweight local development environment using repository-based development, and uh, connector builders to be able to build your own connectors for our iPass. And lastly, there's a, a load of online um, material, tutorials, videos, documentation. Uh, there's our tech communities where you can go and, and get a lot of that information or ask questions. On GitHub, we have a, a presence on GitHub, github.com slash software AG. There are a number of repositories, including one uh, dedicated to the API gateway with, with uh, a whole load of, of samples and, and videos and links to uh, different information. And then there's a developer center on our softwareag.cloud platform on the iPass, where you can get access to, again, videos, tutorials, documentation. And that's me. So do we have any questions? Let me check the Q&A. So there's a question four minutes ago. Can you put this in config files that you can store in Git and apply the same config through different environments using automation? Yes, you can. Yeah. So. I've actually got a longer version of this demo where I show the the conf, uh, how we do CI CD of not just the application but also the policies and the the um, the micro gateway configuration, as you say. Um, typically, we wouldn't do the the live um, introspection of the uh, of the service mesh or the injection of the micro gateway in a non uh, in a production environment we do that in the in the development environment and then as you say take that config store it in git and then use uh, use a cicd or gitops approach to to pass that into new environments uh, any support for push style streaming webhooks or just request response rest style apis at this stage so within the service mesh it's 
more request response. The API gateway does uh, have support for asynchronous APIs. Uh, so it does support uh, Open API 3 with the asynchronous APIs. Uh, we've just added support for gRPC services, not just REST. And um, I'm sure it will keep evolving. It's, it's a, a rapidly evolving space. The, the product is, is uh, it's just been, uh, the API management suite as a whole has just been voted number one uh, API management suite at API World. And we were very proud proud of that and it really is evolving rapidly so when when new new protocols new new techniques new requirements come up they're they're taken very seriously by our product management and i think that's it for questions so thank you very much for your time as i say i'm ian ward you can Contact me on LinkedIn or at my email.